Welcome back everybody to another lecture here in History 1302. And today the topic that we will be covering is that of the New South. Now when we were in class uh, last time, when we were talking about um, the American Gilded Age, we saw how industrialization was greatly impacting the nation. We saw that average Americans were going from being farmers to ultimately taking up wage earning jobs, whether it was working on railways, working in factories, or in a variety of other industries. Now much of our discussion within that class talked about how industrialization impacts American life, especially in the Northeast. However, today we're going to see how the Gilded Age will begin to impact all the other regions of the United States, most notably the South, and as we'll talk about next time, the West because we'll see that it will completely change how American society will look. Now, in regards to the South, when we last talked about the um, region in class, we talked about it during the course of Reconstruction. And we saw in the days after the American Civil War, Southern society looked greatly changed. We saw that re radical Republicans were looking to bring about a complete social revolution in the South. And even though the policies of Reconstruction had not been successful in uh, eventually gaining African, -American, uh, African Americans their rights, we do see that Southern society nonetheless was greatly changed. Especially with the passage of the 13th Amendment prior to Reconstruction, we see that all of a sudden the Southern economy is going to be turned upside down. No longer would it be based off of slave labor, but rather it would be based off of free labor. Now there'll be limitations to that, and we'll talk about it a little bit later on, but nonetheless it will look drastically different. And in the days after the Civil War, as industrialization was going to be, or beginning to take place, many within the South would call for the Southern economy to change, to rebrand itself, to basically catch up with the times, especially of what we see in the North, where a vast amount of wealth was being concentrated. However, while we will see these individuals, and we'll talk about them when we talk about the New South writers, there will be some who will continue to cling on to the past. Most notably, Confederate veterans or Confederate or ex-Confederate officials will continue to cling on to this idea known as a lost cause myth, to where they would glamorize the antebellum South, state that it was the best uh, state of society within history, and they would long for a day to return to it, stating that there was racial harmony and harmony all throughout the South. However, that's not the reality. But nonetheless, this is what white Southerners who lived before the Civil War are going to believe. But with a new generation of Southerners being born after the Civil War and being disconnected from slavery, they're going to begin to argue that Southern society, while we justify what it did during the Civil War, they're going to say it needs to move on. They need to adapt to the times and they need to adapt to a Northern model, bring industry, bring um, jobs to the South. And this will give rise to what's known as the myth of the New South. Now, as a part of this new generation of Southerners who would ultimately dub this term the New South, they're calling on the South to rebrand itself, to begin to uh, reshape Southern society and the model that we see up in the North. And most notably, these New South writers, they would argue that the South should adopt the industrial model we see in the North, to begin to build up industry, to begin to build up factories, so that way the South too could enjoy this period of rapid industrialization and the wealth that came with it. And we'll see there will be various industries that would begin to uh, reflect the models of those big businesses that we saw in the American Northeast. We'll see the rise of the tobacco industry. In some aspects, we'll see the cotton industry also would begin to take shape to this model. Not to mention also the lumber and the coal industries will begin to uh, create big businesses within the South and replicate what we see in the North. However, as a part of this new myth of the New South, while we do see that the uh, that Southerners are trying to rebrand their region and try to reshape and create a truer form of democracy, a more equal society, if you will, this is only going to apply to white Southerners. Because even though this could be new in the Southern mindset, we'll still see a part of these writers, they believe that the ones that should enjoy it is whites. They will uh, push forth during this generation the Jim Crow laws and the law of segregation that we'll talk about about in a little bit. And a big question that we have to ask ourselves in the midst of all this is whether the New South was really new, especially as we see the racial policies look very similar to what we had seen both during Reconstruction and even before it from white Southerners. In the meantime, while there is this buildup in industry, what's also going to look strikingly familiar to the Old South is we'll continue to see that the Southern economy is going to be heavily agrarian. It will be agriculturally based. Because as I mentioned, two of the biggest industries that we see emerge in the South after the Civil War is going to be the tobacco and the cotton industry. Those are major cash crops and we'll continue to see Southern plantation owners as well as Southern farmers grow these um, 
grow these commodities in large numbers. However, they're going to be greatly weakened with the effects of the American Civil War. Because remember, many of these large plantation owners, for them to produce large amounts of cotton or tobacco, they needed slaves. However, they no longer have the slave labor as a result of the 13th Amendment. And so how are they going to get a large workforce? Or well, this is where the uh, sharecropping industry is going to come into play. Now, after the Civil War, now that the 13th Amendment has been passed, we'll see that sharecropping would become ever more prevalent, especially as plantation owners need a large workforce and as formerly enslaved persons need work. Now, typically a part of the sharecropping industry, we'll see that most African Americans who had been recently freed from bondage, they're not going to have any money to go anywhere, and they're virtually going to have no tools. And so the only way that they'll be able to make a living is they will go back to work for their former masters. Now, a part of the sharecropping industry, this will basically make them in a semi-surf state to where they would be tied to the land and there wouldn't be any major prospects for eco economic or social advancement. As a part of sharecropping, these individuals who would work the land for these large plantation owners, they would have to give up about half of their uh, crops, of their cotton harvest typically, as basically rent for staying on the um, plantation owner's land. From here, this will diminish the profits that they would be allowed to make. On top of that, as mentioned before, many African Americans coming out of bondage, they virtually have nothing. The only things they really have is the clothes on their backs. And why does that matter? Well, they're not going to have the necessary tools they would need to till these fields. So where are they going to get those tools? They're going to rent them from the plantation owners who would charge relatively high rents on these products, and this would take away a lot of income from the, um, from the sharecroppers. And likewise, we'll see that because of these two reasons, it's a no surprise that sharecroppers are not going to be, uh, uh, are not going to socially advance very easily, and this is why we'll see the farming community in the South will be relatively poor. Now, sharecroppers, from time to time, they will migrate from different regions in the South to try to take advantage of different economic opportunities, but for the most part, they're going to re remain relatively poor. Now, it is important to note that not all sharecroppers are going to be those formerly enslaved persons. We will also see that poor whites would take up this industry likewise, and by the time we get to the 1900s, after several migrations of African Americans northward into places like Kansas or Chicago or New York, we will see that most of the sharecropping force will be white. But that will take time for this to change. And with those in, who are involved in the sharecropping industry, just to stress this one more time, there's not going to be any room for social advancement. Now, there is another group that falls under the sharecropping industry. They're known as share tenants. And these are typically, uh, I don't want to say more well-off members of society, but typically it's going to be, um, typically it's going to be individuals who can't own their own land, however, they do own their own tools and they will be able to make larger profits. But anyways, that's pretty much what the sharecropping industry will look like in the South. And it's going to keep a lot of people, especially African-Americans, at the bottom of the economic and social order. And on top of that, as we see the sharecropping industry tying these individuals to the land and not allowing them social or economic mobility, we will also see that politically, many African Americans are going to lose their rights during this period following both Reconstruction as well as during the American Gilded Age. As we start to see the passage of a series of laws that would strip them of all those gains we had seen within Reconstruction. The well-known infamous Jim Crow laws. Now, the Jim Crow laws, we talked about them very briefly whenever we were in the period of Reconstruction, but as Reconstruction was coming to a close, we saw that those Southern, uh, um, Southern Redeemer Democrats were coming back to power. They were beginning to institute things like those black codes we talked about before, beginning to strip the civil rights of African Americans, things like the right to vote, in some cases the right to own land, in other places uh, we'll also see that it would be illegal for them to even be unemployed. And so by the 1880s, we will see that these Jim Crow laws will become ever more prevalent throughout the South. And they will promote several things. One, they're going to look to completely eliminate African-American activism within the government. And then also they're going to look to completely segregate Southern society. And the second point is what I'm going to focus on first, because with the Jim Crow laws, we'll see that Southern society will quite literally become white and black as it becomes segregated.
So racial segregation, it begins in the closing days of Reconstruction when we start to see that Southern whites begin to pass policies, whether it was in businesses or whether it was by their state or local governments, that begin to uh, separate whites and blacks within, say, business facilities or even public facilities, things like uh, transportation or restrooms and so on and so forth. And we'll only see that this trend will continue after Reconstruction. However, it won't be until the Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson that takes place in 1896 that we'll start to see the majority of these uh, segregation laws begin to go into effect. Now, Plessy versus Ferguson, and this is a major point to write down because this is a very influential Supreme Court case. We'll see that one individual by the name of Homer Plessy, who was one eighth African American in Louisiana, he will look to challenge one of these segregationist laws that banned whites and blacks from traveling in the same railway car. Now, Homer Plessy will get on a whites only car, he will be kicked off, and he will then take his case before the first Louisiana court system and then all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. However, when he brings his case before the U.S. Supreme Court and states that his uh, rights as an American citizen had been violated, we'll see that the Supreme Court is going to issue a ruling against him. Now, the U.S. Supreme Court, what they're going to establish in Plessy versus Ferguson is that segregation, according to the U.S. Constitution, was legal as long as facilities were separate but equal. Now, what does this notion of separate but equal mean? Well, how the court is going to interpret it, or interpret it is that if you have a whites-only rail car and a blacks-only rail car, if they are the same quality, racial segregation can be legal. This would also apply to things like schools, businesses, and other, um, and other facilities as well. And we'll see that once the Supreme Court ruling was uh, delivered and racial segregation was justified by the highest court in the land, it's a no surprise that we'll see that there will be a large number of these segregationist laws passed throughout all the South, quite literally dividing it along racial lines. Once again, creating blacks-only restrooms, creating whites-only restrooms, creating even in uh, many cases uh, white and black-only cemeteries. You couldn't even see the dead buried together within the American South. Not to mention other facilities that we'll talk in more detail, especially when we get to the civil rights era, including schools, businesses, and so on and so forth. And we'll see this would be the case for what Southern society would look like for the better course of the next uh, really, uh, really half century and even longer than that. Now, alongside this, what we'll also see a part of the segregationist laws and the Jim Crow laws that were being passed, we're also going to see that black voting, as well as uh, African-American participation within politics, is going to virtually come to an end. Now, by the uh, end of Reconstruction, we do start to see that Southern states begin to pass a series of laws that would uh, uh, create a lot of political clout to where African-Americans could not vote or hold public office. Now, there will still be some who can vote as well as hold public office in the South. However, those cases will be relatively few and far between. Now, most notably, when we see these laws go into effect to try to oppress African Americans and ensure they're not able to enjoy their newfound rights from the Reconstruction period, we'd see things pass like a literacy test, a poll tax, and most notably, a grandfather clause that would ensure that African Americans could not practice their right to vote. Now, I want to point out the grandfather clause for just a moment because we see this law in particular discriminates against African Americans and in, um, in their effort to try to gain the right to vote. Now, the grandfather clause is pretty easy to understand. Basically, with, the, uh, with this clause, what it will be stated by Southern law is that the only way, if you were to fail a literacy test and you weren't able to pull, pay a poll tax, the only way you could vote at that point is if your grandfather had voted before you. Now keep this in mind, for many poor whites, they've gained the right to vote for generations up to this point, so they would be included under the grandfather clause to vote even if they had failed a literacy test or a poll tax, or failed to pay a poll tax. However, for African Americans, where it, or where it uh, discriminates against them is going to be because, remember, just 25 years prior to the passage of this law, which I should state is in 1890, most individuals within the African American community were in bondage. Their grandparents did not vote, and i.e., since they did not vote, they could not vote. And this is what's going to contribute to low turnout numbers for African American voters within the South. In the case of uh, many uh, regions throughout the South, we'll see that African American voting during the, uh, uh, the period following Reconstruction is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 20 percent.
down from the 90% that you'd see in Reconstruction. In the case of North Carolina, we'll see after the Wilmington insurrection of 1898, black voting would be down to virtually zero, and it would take eight years before we start to see another African-American voter within, um, within North Carolina. And this was a case all across the South. Now, with these laws put into effect, that oppress African Americans and strip them of their basic civil rights, we'll also see that there would be the threat of racial violence to ensure that these laws would be maintained by white Southerners. And we'll see that while they were being oppressed politically, we'll see that their very lives would be challenged with lynchings that would be conducted all throughout the South. Now, to enforce the Jim Crow laws, we'll see that the legacy of white violence that had begun during Re Reconstruction will continue. We'll see that many local whites, to ensure that African Americans could not challenge either the laws of segregation or these Jim Crow laws, they would begin to inflict racial violence against them. Now, the Klan itself was effectively dead after the uh, period of Reconstruction. However, white vigilantism will only continue. And we most notably see this through what are called lynchings. Now, lynchings are nothing new to world history. However, we will not see a period more intense with lynchings than what we see in the American South between the Civil War and ultimately the Civil Rights Movement. During this period, somewhere in the neighborhood of five to 7,000 African Americans are going to be lynched, mostly men, and they're going to be accused of crimes like raping young girls or murdering somebody and in many cases these are going to be crimes that they did not commit and unfortunately and if you read into some of the episodes which will be present within your um, textbook we'll see that many of them as mentioned before would be innocent now there will be a few african-american activists that would speak out against these lynchings most notably that of ida b wells however there will not be a anti-lynching bill passed either by congress or by the states to outlaw this practice and it will only grow in popularity as we enter a new century once we get to the 20th century now as I mentioned a moment ago with Ida B. Wells and we see some activism against these lynchings, let's go ahead and change the topic now because now that we see all this oppression from the Jim Crow laws and from these lynchings, how does the African American community respond at large? How are they going to respond in this new atmosphere? And so let's shift our focus now to black activism as it begins to take shape within this new period of Jim Crow. So black activism is going to greatly change after the period of Reconstruction. Now during the peri period of Reconstruction, we saw that in promoting African American rights, individuals like Frederick Douglass are going to promote political agitation to achieve those rights. However, that will begin to change with this new atmosphere that we see begin to form within the South with the Jim Crow laws. And most notably, what we'll see is black activism would greatly change under, most notably, Booker T. Washington, who would become the face, if you will, of the civil rights movement in the, um, at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. Now, Booker T. Washington, he's going to establish a very controversial policy on how African Americans should approach activism. He's going to state in his Atlanta Compromise speech in 1895 that African Americans should accept the rule of segregation and with it, sacrifice political rights, sacrifice the right to vote, the right to hold public office to try to achieve economic rights. He was hoping to create a black middle class that would become respectable in his own words, to where one day, by showing the uh, white community of this respectable black middle class, they would then look to apply those civil rights. Now, behind the scenes, he will uh, support organizations that were promoting civil rights, but for the most part, he's going to be public in stating that African Americans should accept racial segregation to achieve economic rights. Well, this is going to be extremely controversial amongst the African American community, not just then, but also today. Uh, and most notably, we'll see one of his starkest uh, critics would be that of W.E.B. Du Bois, who's going to say, why should we sacrifice political rights for economic rights? We need to continue to politically agitate. We need to eventually achieve civil rights in that fashion, because you're simply giving up too much if you're sacrificing political rights. Now, in the long run, W.E.B. Du Bois' uh, method is going to be adopted by individuals like Martin Luther King, as well as uh, Malcolm X once we get to the civil rights movement. But during his time, we'll see that Booker T. Washington would become the face of the civil rights movement. But nonetheless, it would be filled with a lot of controversy back then as it would be today. Now, unfortunately for Booker T. Washington, he would die in 1915 and there, we would not see the end of the Jim Crow South. 
It would take another 50 years. However, with these individuals, we do see how they were beginning to adjust to the new post-reconstruction period and climate that was created uh, as a result of these Jim Crow laws. But anyways, with that said, that's pretty much everything for this topic, the New South. And so we'll go ahead and we'll end our lecture on that note. But anyways, before we end, just like always, a couple of things to uh, be aware. Make sure you go out and complete all assignments, all, um, all readings, as well as make sure you watch all videos that are associated with this week. If you do have any questions in the meantime, always feel free to reach out to me. But otherwise, everybody go out, be safe, and I'll see you all in the next lecture.